Hi, I'm Nicole Stott of the STS-133 crew, and you're watching NASA TV. Good morning, Discovery. We hope you enjoyed that music. That music comes to you from your training team. They're very proud of the job you're doing and making them look good. Hope you liked it. Well, thanks, Mike. Good morning to you guys, and uh, and thanks to our training team. We've had a just a super training team that uh, did a great job with us, and uh, and we really enjoyed training and uh, and had a lot of fun with them uh, all the way through the flow. So uh, thanks to them. Good morning from inside the Payload Operations Center at the Marshall Space Flight Center. I'm Heather Smith, writer of the NASA Education Taking Up Space blog. We are excited to ask you questions chosen by our blog readers today. The first question is for Commander Scott Kelly. What are some ways that the work you do in space can encourage both our youth and scientists working on the ground? Well, I think uh, one of the ways we can encourage uh, kids and, and scientists is that we have an incredibly challenging uh, work environment and a challenging problem building a space station and then, and then utilizing it. And the way we do that is through teamwork. And teamwork is critical, I think, not only here, but getting things accomplished on the ground. So hopefully... Um, in kids and scientists and other professionals looking at the teamwork that uh, NASA uses to get things done, they can take inspiration from that and, uh, and use that themselves uh, for whatever they're involved with on the ground. Great. The next question is for Katie Coleman. What kinds of experiments are currently being conducted on the station, and how will the research benefit people on Earth? We're doing some really exciting experiments in crystal growth, in fluid physics, in combustion. And sometimes those, those things sound like, well, why would I want to know about that? Well, combustion, it's all about pollution. Up here where everything is weightless, those hot gases don't rise. And we can understand how we can actually look at how things burn and how pollution products are generated so we can do combustion research. We get to see for fluid physics, we get to see what liquids really want to do down on Earth, gravity actually dictates. It's such a big force compared to all the other ones. Gravity dictates. And so we can understand what liquids really want to do. And so many processes on Earth are, are liquids going through pipes. Everything that you want to play with or that is, um, that is made uh, and manufactured is liquid flowing through a pipe and making a product. So we learn a lot about how to make things on Earth by experimenting up here on, in space. OK, for Commander Lindsay. How has the station changed since you were first there? 
Well, the, the station is probably on the inside and the outside about three times bigger than the last time I was here. Uh, when I was here last time, we had the U.S. lab and the airlock and, uh, and the Russian segment. Um, but since then, uh, the Russians have added, uh, I guess, three modules. Uh, we've, we've added the uh, module we're in here now, the, uh, the, the, the Japanese module, the, the Columbus module, of course, the multipurpose module that we just added. Um, we have a couple of transfer vehicles here that we didn't have before. We've added an additional, two additional nodes uh, on the cupola, um, and uh, it's a magnificent place now. I, I, when I first uh, opened the hatches and floated in a few days ago after docking, I was just shocked at the size of the station. Additionally, we've uh, added uh, three more solar arrays since I was here, and so even uh, coming up to rendezvous, uh, looking out and seeing the station, it looked like almost a totally different place. So it has changed dramatically, and I'm, uh, it's really excited to, exciting for all of us to see the, the, the space station completely assembled. Great. Thank you. This is Joe Charbonnet. I'm an intern from Georgia Tech, and my question is for Colonel Bo, a fellow Ramblin' Wreck. What role do you think that robots will play in the future of space exploration? Go Jackets, and what's the good word? Go Jackets. I think uh, robots will take a uh, more and more, uh, much bigger role as time goes on. Just like computers, if I asked someone back in the 60s and 70s, what, what would the role be of computers in the average person's life? Most people probably said not a whole lot. But now we have computers in everything. So I think robots are the same way. And that's, uh, robots will allow us, we'll have a, a good synergy between the human and the robot. And they'll be able to do things that we consider mundane or dangerous, like going into smoke-filled compartments. And that's the purpose of a Robonaut R2 that we have up here, is to start looking at those tasks and trying to refine them and optimize them. So I see a, a bigger role as time continues for Robonaut and the robotics. OK, back to Heather. This question is for Al Drew. How well does reduced gravity flight prepare you for what it's like to be in space? Well, the short answer is it's very useful. Uh, in preparing for space, we have a number of different things we can use. Uh, we have the neutral buoyancy laboratory, the pool, that helps us, but it doesn't necessarily um, give us that free-flowing feel because that the water's viscous and it resists our motion. Uh, we also have virtual reality laboratories, which give us a good visual sense of what it's like to be in space, uh, but it doesn't, also, doesn't, all, it doesn't give us that same the dynamics, the, kin the kinematics of, of running around in space. Uh, the reduced gravity flights give you all that. Uh, you are weightless, just like you'd be in orbit, for brief periods of time, and so you can get a sense of you know, how things can move around uh, freely uh, without those other restrictions on them. This question is for Steve Bowen. How has greater internet connectivity and social media affected the spaceflight experience? Sorry about the delay. Well, that's actually an interesting question because I, I actually spent 14 years in submarine force where we had zero internet connection. <laughs> and uh, so the similarities between spaceflight and submarines uh, is very real. And this communication up here with the uh, internet, with the ability to tweet, uh, it's all about communication. And communication uh, can lead to some deception as well. You know, just like the internet is full of information, but it's not necessarily knowledge. It's data, it's information, but it's not real knowledge. It's not real action. You know, tweeting provides little bits and glimmers of data and little hints at information, but unless you're actually there and they have the ability to perform some action, uh, you know, it can give you a, a slight sense of it, but you really need to be there in any of these communication forms, regardless whether it's social media, whatever term you want to use now for modern communication. So it's, it can lead to the mis idea, this misapprehension that you have control over something when you don't. So you don't want to be running your life on the internet from here. You actually need to be someplace to do something. So while it helps bring people in, I hopefully it draws you in so you actually want to be there. And that in and of itself, it's not sufficient to replace you know, space flight or any other activity that you're doing. Okay. This question is for Mike Barrett. What do you think is the greatest legacy of the Space Shuttle program? Well, 
Well, that's a great question with a really big answer. You know, the, the space shuttle has become such an icon of human spaceflight, and I think that's well-deserved. If you look at it, you have a, the biggest thing is really a broad-based knowledge base of how to work in space. As a, a space medicine guy, I look at the hundreds of human spaceflight experiences we have off the shuttle, and uh, that's what you need to really solidify your, your knowledge of how the human reacts to the short-term spaceflight the shuttle has given us. Uh, and beyond that, we've got uh, uh, propulsion, robotics, hypersonic flight, uh, physics of low Earth uh, orbit. I mean, the space shuttle has just given us a tremendous knowledge base of how to do business in space. So I think that's really the big thing. Okay, for Nicole Stott, what would life in space be like without the use of robotics? Well, I think very simply, it would be um, a lot more difficult. Um, if we just look at the space station as an example, whether it's uh, assembly or the EVA tasks that we have or some of the uh, um, what might be thought of today because of robotics, um, simple maintenance tasks that we have on the outside of the vehicle, it would be a lot more difficult if we didn't have um, the robotic arms that we use to manipulate both our uh, EVA crew members and the hardware that we have outside. Um, and I think that's just one simple example of how robotics has helped us uh, in spaceflight. For Commander Lindsay, what do you do for fun in microgravity, and do you have any special tricks you like to do? Yeah, we call those stupid astronaut tricks, and uh, <laughs> I have several that I'm not very good at, but uh, and I have the bruises to show for it. but. Uh, you know, just uh, you can just see one of our crew members just floated away. Uh, you see Scott's uh, doing a little flip for you. Um, so we can do that all day long. What's really interesting is, uh, I'll give you a little physics lesson here, uh, is that when you throw a ball on the earth, play catch or something like that, you, uh, you have to actually loft that ball uh, for, uh, because gravity will cause that ball to drop. Um, and, and we do it subconsciously just because we're used to living in 1G. When you come up here in space, the first time you try to throw a ball or, a, or any item to another crew member, you in, invariably will throw it over that person's head because you are used to lofting all the time. So the, one of the biggest challenges in just uh, moving around and floating through the modules is to not loft yourself so that you don't slam into the top of uh, wherever you're traveling. But, uh, but you never get tired of, uh, of playing in microgravity and, and learning how to move around and, uh, and do things. Thank you all so much for joining us today and answering our questions. Well, you're welcome, and uh, thanks for uh, joining us. We, uh, we enjoyed your questions. Uh, for your earlier question about the A, B, and C brackets, um, we do expect to install all of those today, so do keep that bag handy. But that's not the question, Stan. We have installed all of those. And the question is, uh, I think there might be some spots that don't have them. Does that mean that there's more called out in storage notes further in during, down the day that I just haven't found? Checking. <laughs> Excellent. All right, you're standing in front of uh, one of our glacier units, and I just want you to confirm for me that uh, you did see me removing that and transferring it with one on the station. I do see that, and I see serial number 003 for confirmation. Excellent. You didn't just swap the stickers. I did not swap the stickers. Okay. I swapped the units. Good call. And we're going to get ready to do some transfers into that freezer. Okay, good. Thank you. Now we're entering into the uh, lab module, the U.S. lab module. And down on the deck, we'll find, I believe, Dr. Mike Barrett, Commander Steve Lindsay. It's a little difficult to um, make them out right here, but what they're doing is they have just transferred this big, large rack from our PMM, the, the new module that was installed, and they transferred it here into the lab module for uh, operation. I believe this has another refrigerator in it and some other um, some other science lockers as well. All right, this is Paulo Nespoli, Hello. one of our very gracious hosts here on the space station. And he's working with the CSACPs. These are some little units that we use to monitor things like our oxygen, 
carbon monoxide and uh, and other things in the air here to make sure that we're safe. And he's getting those all ready so we can swap some out and take some back. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. All exactly. Right. We are checking all the ones. We have a bunch of those on the station. Some here, some of the Soyuz, some on the Russian uh, segment, and we check all of them, make sure we have everything working. We'll give you back whatever it has. All right, and we'll take them. Get, 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 Thank get, you, Paula. Attention. Ooh, B. Alvin Drew, hey. coming out of the newest, and as we know right now, final U.S. module to be attached to the International Space Station. What's going on in down in there today, Al? We're installing brackets. 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 Brackets for racks. All right, because there's a lot of racks down in there, aren't there? A lot of racks, a lot of rack spaces down there. And so this is a nice big new closet, yes. kind of storage area. Yep. All right, and we're going to uh, move things from the station in here and take some stuff back. Um, and I'll just take you in and show you. Nice music playing. It's a nice big space. And back in the corner, there he is, Steve Bowen, working hard on a bracket. He's going to have to say a few words to us. Do it. It's just like a Saturday afternoon in the garage. All right. Thank you, Steve. Except I had the right tools at home. Oh. <laughs> The lovely Katie Coleman entering the PMM <laughs> with tools. Ooh, maybe it's the right tools. Well, we're trying. Scott and Nicole transferring some very cold stuff. Chitty. Don't stick your tongue on it. It'll stick. You do that once. Forever. Have to leave you here. These are some of the cold packs that come from our minus 80 degree laboratory freezer. We're going to be using to bring down. Ooh, definitive. <laughs> our morning rush right here. It's our only weather we have here on the space station. It's right there. Zero, zero, zero. Frosty. With you, Scott and crew, and we'll start off questions with Robert Perlman. Hi, Robert Perlman with CollectSpace.com with a question for Commander Steve Lindsay and his uh, Discovery crewmates. Outside of times when the media, like myself, ask about this being Discovery's last mission, how prevalent has the finality of this flight been during the course of your mission? Have there been specific times where the legacy and history of the vehicle has struck you? Well, that's a, uh, that's a difficult question. Um, We've been very busy during our mission, as all shuttle missions are and space station missions. And so mostly we've been probably spent spending 95 percent of our time to 99 percent on just doing the work and uh, and getting the work done. And and so when you're really busy like that, you're focusing on doing the task, doing the task correctly, making sure you uh, you get everything done how it's supposed to be done and, and don't miss anything. However, there are times, uh, I know personally, when I've been reflecting about it, uh, being the last mission and, and what a wonderful vehicle it is. and Probably, you know, we were coming up and docking, and, and when you look out the cupola windows, you can look right into Discovery's payload bay and see the wings and see Discovery written on the wings. And times like that, I really reflect about uh, what a great vehicle it's been, 39 missions, uh, nearly one year on orbit, and uh, think about all the things that that vehicle has done, and, and uh, it's just really inspiring to me and, uh, and kind of bittersweet um, and, and quite frankly sad that, that knowing that when we land, that will be it for this vehicle. Thank you. And, and to follow up on that, uh, a question for Steve Bowen and Al Drew. Um, they say a picture is worth a thousand words, and through your helmet cam, we got to see uh, when you took a glance at Discovery uh, docked to the station during your spacewalks. Um, would you, uh, one or both of you, describe what it was like uh, to see Discovery there and, uh, and reflect on its, uh, its past 365 days in space? A lot of us were captured, re repeated what Steve had from the cupola, uh, just to have Discovery right there and filling our entire visor up close and personal. Uh, you realize it's just a magnificent ship. Uh, it's huge, it's complex, uh, just a wonderful, um, completely capable vehicle. 
And uh, to be out there um, working on and around and near it is just a privilege. To be part of the legacy of Discovery is, is just a, um, I guess it just seems like a blessing. This is Gerhard Daumer, the German Aerospace Center and Space Expo Association. Question for L. Drew. What was the most difficult and the most exciting moment during your EVAs? Uh, that's easy. They were both the same. Uh, when I first exited the airlock on my first EVA, uh, we were over top the jungles. It looked like it was like maybe South America, the Amazon basin somewhere. Uh, just beautiful, the clouds, the river valleys down there, all the greenery. And I had to remind myself that I had work to do and I couldn't just take in the scenery. Um, so it was exciting and it was difficult to tear my eyes away from that and actually focus on getting things ready for our tasks ahead. Question for Paolo. You accomplished about half of your long duration mission. What was your most challenging task and did you have any surprises and what was your most exciting moment so far? Well, it's been a pleasure so far here. We've been spent uh, yet yeah, two months, uh, Expedition 26. And uh, I think the most challenging uh, time here is not, there is not really a time. I mean, it's the, the challenge is when I look at a procedure for the first time, it's, it looks very complex and I try to understand and interpret it, try to do it without making mistakes, and sometimes I do. Uh, so I, I think those are the, for me, are the most uh, challenging times. But uh, as usual, with uh, familiarity, we're repeating things, uh, things get familiar, and uh, we get to do it with uh, no problems. And of course, we always have the ground control, mission control helping us and keeping us out of troubles. This is Jill Tolk representing the Cohasset Mariner in Massachusetts. A question for the East Coast, Steve. What has been the most challenging part and the most rewarding part of your unexpected shuttle flight? I think the most challenging part was uh, trying to get up to speed to understand the EVAs and then uh, even more so trying to get up to speed with everything else that goes on on a shuttle flight and where my tasks would be and what they were and how familiar I was with them and how much more training I had to have. So that was uh, clearly the most difficult part of it. Uh, the, the best part really was, you know, getting to, to work with the crew. It's uh, four of my classmates from uh, 2000 and uh, Commander Steve Lindsay, and that's been great, uh, great crew. Just having the ability to spend time with them, it's uh, been fantastic. And then getting up here with the ISS crew, it's been really the best part of it. Thanks for the good word, Steve-O. Now a question for the West Coast, Steve, and for Eric Bow. What good Bowen anecdote from this week could you share with newspaper readers in his hometown? We're consulting. Hang on. I, I, I think the favorite, uh, our favorite uh, Steve Bowen story for, uh, for this mission so far was, uh, and I'm sure there are more to come, um, was uh, when, uh, when Steve was taking a pump module off of, uh, off of a, a, a transporter on the, on the truss segment, uh, EVA and, and Mike Barrett and uh, Scott Kelly were driving him on the robotic arm. Um, about the time they released that pump module, um, which is about a, uh, it's a several hundred pounds, for Steve to uh, to take in his arms so they could fly him over to where it belonged, um, the the entire uh, space station robotic arm crashed, and uh, which means he was stuck there holding this uh, payload for not for for what seemed like a really long time for him, but actually uh, the, the crew did a great job reconfiguring to a to an alternate to robotic workstation to get it back alive pretty quickly. But Steve was stuck there for probably, I don't know, 30, 35 minutes uh, holding this pump module loose. And so it gave us an opportunity to, uh, to joke with him and kind of make fun of him while he was out there stuck with nowhere to go. Uh, Mark Caro for Aviation Week, and I have a couple of questions. The first is for Scott Kelly. Could you sort of explain how the uh, extra time that Discovery is spending at the space station benefits the station ops the most? Well, uh, in the original plan, they were uh, not going to have much involvement in getting uh, P-1 
PMM basically emptied out of a lot of the hardware that needs to be disposed of on HTV. So when they were going to leave, uh, we were going to really be in a, uh, a time crunch to get uh, all this, you know, all these metal structures and foam and stuff that we want to dispose of in HTV because HTV has to leave at a certain time. So by having the uh, the extension gives us two extra days of six people, which is a lot of crew time to get all that stuff or, or some of it uh, done uh, before they leave. And then it kind of, um, you know, it just helps maximize our time uh, post undocking for things like science and, uh, you know, other activities we have to perform uh, on board the space station on a daily basis. Good afternoon, Enrica. We're working very hard inside the uh, Leonardo module uh, because it came in a flight configuration, so everything is fastened uh, in a way to secure it for launch. So we're removing all the uh, packing materials and uh, so that we can stow it in the Japanese module that's going to be leaving soon. So we're using all the astronauts, including the uh, Discovery crew that are staying here another couple of days to help us with that. Good evening, Paolo, and good evening to the whole crew. I'm from uh, Sole 24 Ore newspaper. So in less than two weeks, on March 17th, it's 150 years of the unity of Italy. So how do you plan on celebrating aboard the uh, International Space Station, an event that's so important for the uh, nation? Surely, this is a very important holiday for our country. I'm a little limited in, in being able to celebrate. I have brought a little flag that I will be able to uh, fly on that day and uh, from the cupola, which is also an Italian product. Seeing Italy from up here is a beautiful view and I have tried to uh, have everyone partake in it by sending pictures and it's a country that stands out from the Mediterranean both during the day and at night. It's, uh, it's easy to see how beautiful it is from a geographical and natural point of view and we have to keep it in that way. Full lens cover MLIs go in that bag. So that was uh, airlock deck two air bag ten seventy eight. That's with those two MLI lens covers with lens covers in them uh, goes. Good copy. Houston on two for water. Go ahead, Katie. Can you verify step 2.1 for me? Checking. Station crew members uh, routinely also have a daily planning conference, a DPC, uh, early in their day, uh, a couple of hours after wake up. In each case, they check in with their flight control teams around the world to uh, review the plan for the day ahead and uh, in the evening to uh, to touch base on what they have been working on throughout the day today. Go ahead. And Houston, the approximate time for the film. Hello, um, I am working in the PMM on um, step 10 Delta. And Katie, stand by at ground two. We'll be about right back with you. 
Okay, Nicole, go ahead for 10.2. It's um, step 10 Delta. Copy, 10 Delta. All right, and on the, um, the top of that, that table E, where it says uh, current location PMM end cone and then has an M01 back. We're with you. Uh, there's something there that says foam cushions 5, and I'm supposed to put them in the PMM end cone, but I have no idea where those are coming from. We will look. Thank you. And you don't see those inside the Melfi bag? Eastern on two, do you have to uh, Inside of the M01 bag, there are um, six cushions. Um, so am I supposed to leave one of those in there? We're checking.